Okay, so this week we're looking at the various information-based contexts for teaching digital technologies. And we're going to look at a range of different solution types that students can generate within this context. So firstly, there's data acquisition, then data representation, then data interpretation, then this particular type of data around geospatial data, and then looking at data privacy and security solutions. So data acquisition, while it used to be part of digital technologies as a separate area, is now very much integrated with the statistics context in the mathematics learning area. Um, there was a lot of overlap between what was being taught in mathematics and digital technologies. So it's decided to integrate the two and the descriptors are contained in the mathematics learning area, but they very much rely upon activities that are done in conjunction with the technologies learning area and in particular digital technologies. So in the mathematics learning area, the, um, the context of statistics is where you'll find um, the elements related to data acquisition and also data analysis. While representation, while still also being done in um, mathematics, is still the, is now the primary focus of the digital technologies learning area. So let's look at what's being taught through the mathematics learning area around data. So acquiring data through surveys and observations, uh, experiments, and using digital tools is a key aspect in the early years. So actually creating lists and tables and graphs and things of that nature. So some of the suggested activities that students should work through or could work through, um, doing a survey of their classmates around their interests and listing from most popular to least popular, say their most popular foods and least popular foods, things of that nature, the process of collecting data. Other activities include um, exploring what data means. So collecting a whole lot of data around what's being recycled or not recycled. What does it mean for something to be recycled? So it can be linked into other aspects of their learning. But the aspect related to digital technologies is focusing on the idea of this information as being data that we can collect. Now, through this, students should become familiar with a whole range of different um, tools, such as a form to do a survey on where they can tick things or, and things of that nature and also potentially digital forms and digital um, tools that can be used in the same way. And then they can sort these, but most of the stuff done in years one and two are done without using a lot of digital technologies. <laughs> but the mathematics learning area does actually mandate, the, or does suggest the use of software in doing these approaches. Um, previously, digital technologies, we didn't, um, use technology, digital technologies at that point, but now it has been incorporated. So students could also go out and observe things such as the different vehicles passing um, into the school car park, um, doing a survey of their, of their classmates again on how they get to school and looking at ways they can categorize that data and interpret it, which is done a little bit later. They can also look at other sorts of data, such as the sorts of data used and collected by First Nation Australians and how they use message sticks and um, paintings and even songs and other um, what we would call non-traditional, um, well, I suppose it's more traditional, but <laughs> different ways of engaging with data than our Western tradition of data collection. So the other aspect in years one and two is around creating graphical representations of their data. And essentially these are graphs, um, but they can also be other particular forms of graphs, such as pictographs. So in this um, suggested exam activity, students collect, collect data from a range or limited range of choices and 
create various representations of that data. So it might be their favorite colors, or they might collect weather data and draw pictures of the sun if it's sunny, pictures of a rain cloud if it's rainy, things of that nature, and put that onto some sort of time graph where things change over time. Students can also collect data for displays, such as making a classroom um, data wall or um, uh, biographical data about their families, um, how many, where their parents came from, for example, it might be a, a way of collecting data and then representing that data in some form of pictograph or other display aspect of data. Um, in this example, they're more explicit, explicitly um, exploring pictographs where they're using pictures to represent something. Um, some form of data. In this case, it's the number of fruit. Um, so how many apples, or how many students like apples versus strawberries versus oranges? What's their favorite fruit? So there can be a range of ways of representing information other than just using numbers or lines on a graph. Um, and then they can compare these graphs with other forms of graphs comparing pictographs with line graphs, comparing line graphs with bar graphs, comparing bar graphs with pie charts. There's a range of different ways of representing the same data using different um, pictures. Now, this isn't quite acquisition. Now it's more representation, but it's incorporated into the mathematics curriculum at this point. And very commonly in our primary schools, we use um, sticker charts and dot points or dot plots to tally various things. Um, in this case, students that are on time and have a good attitude or how long it takes them to eat breakfast and things of that nature. So simplified forms of graphing and graphical representation of data. Then as they go into years three and four, they start looking at other ways of collecting data and representing data. We won't go through these year three and four in more detail, um, but they then start doing statistical investigations. So working at averages and trying to communicate what this data means um, in slightly more mathematical processes. So they could, in a spreadsheet, um, Again, compare column graphs to line graphs and grouping various values together and discussing what these mean. So, and again, in years five and six, um, doing more complex statistical investigations and refining the questions that they want to um, uncover through the collection of this data. Now, one of the things we do a lot of in digital technologies is data collection through the use of devices, like computers, and other devices. And in your tutorial this week, we're going to explore the use of a scientific probe to automate the data collection process. So in this case, we're going to use a moisture sensor attached to a, a little computer board that's going to record over time the moisture in a pot plant. Now you can imagine other forms of automatic data collection would be a weather station that records the temperature automatically every hour and the um, barometric pressure. Uh, it might also measure the amount of sunlight. There can be a whole range of different um, measurements that can be automatically collected. And students can then record this in things such as spreadsheets and then use these the capabilities of spreadsheets to um, tally up or count the number of values in a column and then do more complex calculations on those in later years but at the, in years in primary years they don't tend to do much more than look at changing the format from text to numbers to dates um, within the cells. In terms of the curriculum, what it requires, 
but you'll find a lot of students may want to do things such as calculate the average or and things of that nature, slightly more complex capabilities of spreadsheets. Um, a few other suggestions such as looking at water usage and comparing what the um, national and international averages of water use are with what students are finding their own water use involves. So collecting data about the water being used in their home, how much, how long they leave the shower on for, how long they run the dishwasher for, how long they water the plants for, and measuring these. They can also go out to the water meter and actually record what the water meter in their homes is, and then after 24 hours, go out again and re-record and get a measurement in that way of the amount of water being used by their household. Another example is collecting data about the number of um, cars or pets they have at home um, and then analysing these and comparing different values, maybe between classes, or the different values even within the class and then discussing what this means. And then they can do other things around data collection or acquisition, acquisition such as doing surveys and look at different ways of doing surveys, such as um, this is called a Likert scale or a five point scale, where they can have um, participants choose between a picture or choose between a word description or just a numerical value. And what that then means in different ways that um, they can interpret those approaches to collecting data. How might they be misinterpreted? Does a five mean it's good or bad? Does a smiley face mean it's good or bad? It's a little bit easier to understand. So in digital technologies, data acquisition is primarily focused around data logging and collecting data through digital devices, but also how we record this data in things such as spreadsheets. Um, but the idea that data doesn't just have to be numbers, it can be words and sounds and images and video, and when these are digitized, they're reduced to binary numbers, binary codes, and that can then be transmitted and stored onto computer devices. Um, can save them onto our um, flash drives or transmit them as an attached file over email. There's ways of then utilizing that data and moving that data around because it's been digitized. Another aspect of this is what's called synchronization. Now, in computing, when we have some data, we often also attach a little bit of extra data at the front, sometimes at, at the end as well. But this then tells us what format that data is in. Now, you may have experienced this yourself. Um, you might have different music files. It might be MP3, which is a particular format for encoding music. And there's MP4, which is a coding for video. Um, but there's also AVI, which is a different coding for video. So there's different ways of coding videos. Likewise, there's different ways of coding uh, images. Um, BMP or bitmaps is a one format for coding um, pictures. JPEG, JPG is a different form for encoding pictures. And in order to decode, all the binary information, it needs to know how it was encoded, how, what sort of way did it um, encode that information. So that if it, if we see the file and it thinks it's a music file when it's really a picture file or a video file, it would produce a whole lot of rubbish music. It wouldn't sound correct. Of course, it would be decoded incorrectly. All the zeros and ones would turn into the wrong values for the sounds. But if it was encoded correctly for a video file, it would then turn into pictures. It would be decoded into uh, video. So this is what's called synchronization. So it's a little bit of information in what's called the header. Um, and it allows the computer then to know what to do with the stream of zeros and ones that are encoded in binary. The other aspect that students need to become familiar with is the idea that we can have errors. 
Now, errors can occur in non-digital data, um, and it sounds like a little bit of a distortion. So if you're listening to an old record or an old um, tape recording, you'll hear some hisses and, and some things that aren't quite perfect in the sound. And that's, of course, there's some errors in the data. There's scratches, there's little variations that cause the um, playback device, the record player or tape player, to take the data coming in from the record as it moves around the grooves and it doesn't quite record or replicate exactly what was recorded. There's some little variations. The same can occur in digital data. And you may see that sometimes when you have a video recording that um, starts dropping out and you get some little what's called pixelization where you, large squares appear or little spots appear and there's little errors in the data. Now digital data is often quite um, robust. There's a lot of built-in information um, including what's called checksums that validate whether or not the encoded bit of data is the exact right length and if it's not then it represents there's probably an error that's occurred in that code of data that means there's now an error there and it can ask for the information to be resent. Um, but in general, digital data, if there's too many errors, then it just won't work. It'll decode incorrectly. So granularity is another concept that students um, learn. And that's where it's more the detail in the data that's been um, recorded. So let's recall this the precision. Um, a good example of this is in uh, digital images. If you've got a five megapixel picture, then that means there's five megabytes of data. So it's a really long series of zeros and ones, five million zeros and ones um, that have encoded the information. Whereas if you've got a 10 kilobyte picture, say one you've copied off the internet, it might only have 10,000 zeros and ones. So there's a lot less data. Um, so there's a lot less zeros and ones. So what that means is that if you were doing an image on a screen, let's say it was a 10 pixel by 10 pixel image. Um, and that would then contain 100 zeros and ones, 100 bits of data, if it was just um, black or white. We tend to have a lot long, lot larger amounts of data because we have lots of variations in the amount of grayness. And then we also introduce color, which introduces more um, zeros and ones for each pixel. But if it's a 10 by 10 block, then it's a very blocky image. Um, so you can only do very simple um, emoticons and like very simple symbols. But if you've got lots and lots of um, megabytes, you could have a hundred by a hundred or a thousand by a thousand or 10,000 by 10,000. And so each time you increase the number on each axis, the pixels get smaller and smaller. And that refers to resolution. And our eyes can't then detect um, the blockiness in the images. Whereas you've probably seen low quality images that you've copied off the internet or things like that. Um, because they've been compressed down and reduced in size, they've lost a lot of that data and they are much blockier, a lot less resolution. Now, there are some approaches though that we use to get rid of some of that data. If you've got a whole lot of blue sky, then instead of recording all the data for each of those pixels of blue sky, you could just have one little bit of data that says this is all these pixels represent the same thing. So instead of having um, 100 zeros and ones to represent each pixel in the sky, we say that one pixel is has got 100 zeros and ones, and then all the others are the same as this one. And so they can all be represented by only a couple of um, zeros and ones. This is called compression. And what we do then is if there's lots of similarities in an image, 
then we can make the file size much smaller. So likewise, we can do that with video. We can make the, the video size much smaller than if every single pixel has to be fully represented by zeros and ones. So let's take a break. And what I want you to do is to do a little exercise in data compression, going through the process of, in a text file, making it much smaller by looking where there are similarities that can be reduced by um, representing them by different symbols. So have a look at this little exercise. It'll only take a few minutes. And then we'll go on and look at the next type of data interaction. OK, so hopefully you've been able to see a little bit about what is involved in compression of data. Now, with your students, you'll need to go through a lot of these concepts. Uh, particularly around resolution. There's lots of good activities you can do around uh, learning about image resolution and all those sort of activities. This is just one of them. So now let's look at the concept of data representation. Now we saw some examples of this when we were looking in the mathematics learning area. But in digital technologies, there's a particular focus on data representation. So once we've collected data or sourced data in some way, how can we represent this data? And computers are really quite good at doing this. As we've seen, we can make um, spreadsheets and use those spreadsheets to create a range of different graphs. And the great advantage then is if we want to change the graph, we can just make a choice and choose a, different, choose a pie graph and then choose a line graph and then choose a bar graph. And it only takes seconds to make that transition and look at different types of graphs from the same set of data. Whereas if you have to do that on, on paper, you've got to redo the whole thing pretty much every time. So there are lots of ways that we can do things using computers um, that, we, that are easier. So students will learn about how we can use whole numbers to recognize how digital systems represent data. So first thing is they need to learn about binary and how we can convert from one type of symbol to another type of symbol. So we looked a bit about symbols last week. Now we're going to look at it a bit more. So for example, we can convert a, a letter or a series of letters in terms of a word into a number. Um, T-E-N, we can convert into the number 10. Um, we could also convert it into the Roman numeral X. So going back into another um, letter conversion. But we can convert between these. Likewise, we can convert um, the number two into one zero in binary, um, where one zero represents the number two. Uh, zero one represents the number one. One one represents the number three in decimal number three. So a lot of these number systems and number processes are involved in converting from one format to another format. And this is important when we look at computers, because as we talked about before around how we can encode things and we have that header that lets us know what the sort of information is that's been encoded in zeros and ones, we need to know that for a lot of other things. If we say we're going to put the word um, 10 in, in, in some text, we need to encode that and we call that a string. So it's a string of letters. It's actually what's called a string of alphanumerical characters, which can include letters and numbers. So if we've said we're using a string, we've defined our, our, our material, our data as a string, then that means we can do certain things with that, but it means we can't do other things. We can't take our word 10 and add the word 3 to it and get 13. Of course, they're two strings. The computer can't see them as numbers. 
We could, though, describe them as numbers. And then we could have the numerals 10 and the numerals 3. And then we could add them and subtract them and things like that. But if we define them as strings, we can't. But likewise, if we define them as numbers, we can't then put in the letter C because the computer can't doesn't know what to do with the letter C. It doesn't know how to add C to 3 because that doesn't make sense to it. Um, so what we call data types becomes important. Um, OK. So in the curriculum, in years one and two, students focus on representing different representing data in these different ways as pictures as symbols as numbers and as words and knowing that the same information can often be represented in different ways and through this they look at what's called patterns um, so in this case we're looking at different symbols and how we can see different patterns in these symbols and also how we can represent how these symbols can represent things so the green circle might represent a leaf. Um, the blue triangle might represent a rock. And so in the school garden, we're counting the number of leaves and number of rocks. Um, and then we might see if there's a pattern in that data. And there's various other approaches we can then explore. But the main focus is students understanding that we can go between real things and symbols for those real things. And then we can use many different types of symbols for those real things. In years three and four, students progress to looking at how the same data can be used to represent different things for different purposes. So looking at why we're using these different representations. So for example, a picture of a tree um, outside their window but we could also write a story about the tree. We could also draw a map of the school showing where the tree is. Um, we could take a photo of the tree. All of these are different representations of the same physical object. And they might be used for different purposes. One is for finding your way around in, in relationship to the tree using a map. Another may be telling the story of the life cycle of the tree. Another may be drawing a picture of the tree as a season change and as leaves drop and things of that nature. So there can be different reasons why we depict the tree in different ways. We take our data about the tree, number of leaves and the color it is, the location. This all represents data about the tree and we can encode that in different ways using different symbols. They should also look at how or another example of looking at different uh, approaches to the same data, um, looking at how the letter, the word for can be represented as a um, numerical for, or Roman numerals for, or um, for strokes, or um, quarter in terms of musical representations and things of that nature. Or we can have other different symbols in terms of dice and there's a range of different ways we can represent um, the concept of four. Likewise, though, it doesn't just have to be numerical numbers or words. Um, stop signs. There can be different ways of representing the concept of a sign to tell people to stop. Um, we can have hands, different shapes, different words, different colors all providing that information about that someone should stop. And then there's also indigenous approaches who often have different ways of um, presenting information around data to ways that we have in the West through songs and stories, song lines that tell stories on how to travel from one location to another location and how to find food as they make those journeys, how different paintings and rock carvings and rock art represent different things to different um, at different times in different ways. 
And then in years five and six, we look at how digital systems can represent all data using numbers, using binary. So this is where we take all of those different symbols and pictures and stories, and video, and we convert them all into numbers, into binary that allow computers to then work on those to transmit them to other locations, to display them onto TVs and um, computer displays and mobile phone displays, um, to take sounds and then to play those sounds through our mobile devices and our TVs and things of that nature, all through the power of digital technologies, which didn't exist prior to 50 years ago. Prior to then, we had to record things onto um, onto physical devices that moved up and down as sound waves changed or to have particular emulsions on um, pieces of paper that would, re would react to light and to create photographs. It was a lot more complex and difficult. With digitization, though, we can now do things in far more efficient and effective ways. So some approaches students can take to exploring these concepts, um, looking at how we can represent whole numbers in binary and how we can encode. So how we can calculate um, what a um, numerical value, a, de a decimal value would represent in binary and vice versa, how we could take a binary number and what, what it would represent in decimal. Uh, there are other forms though as well that, that students will look at in later years um, in terms of octal and hex, hexadecimal and other formats but in primary we primarily focus on binary and decimal conversion. Now with that students can then represent other things. So one is taking encoding the alphabet into in this case, not binary, but it's um, four zeros and ones. Um, and this is called four, bit, four bits, four bits of information that can be used to encode all the letters from A to Z. Now, once we have this, we know that every four um, beads, in this case, can represent a letter. If they are all um, the light color, then that represents, uh, no, none of them represent that, but okay. Um, well, we can take different combinations. Actually, sorry, this is eight bits. We have eight um, zeros and ones that can represent all the letters of the alphabet. And if it's a red bead, that represents a one. If it's a blue bead, it represents a zero. And we know that then every eight beads, we can then work out what letter that is. Then the next eight beads will be the next letter. Then the next eight beads, the next letter. And so with that, we can then create bracelets and necklaces with simple words, such as someone's name. Or the example here is a um, an acknowledgement of country of the local indigenous name for the location that students are in. Another approach is students looking at how these zeros and ones can represent electrical signals, which is what they are in computers, but um, looking at how a one can represent a light being on and a zero representing the light being off. Or we connect them up to things like our makey makeys and things of that nature and then create simple switches. And then that can have things occur on our computer, depending upon how the switch is configured. So all of this is just exploring how students can see the value of um, having things in digital form and how they can be encoded. Students don't need to memorize how to do things in binary and they don't have to learn it as a, a way of calculating. But they need to understand that the power of computing comes from things being turned into zeros and ones and allowing us to then do a whole lot of stuff with that. 
So another example here is using zeros and ones to represent the Morse code for sending messages. Um, so a different alphabet encoded than we saw previously for the binary one, where we used eight bits. Um, this one, all the letters of the alphabet can be encoded in five dots or dashes. And there was a particular um, yes, no questioning process you can go through to work out what all the letters are. Um, if it starts with a dot and there's nothing else, then that's an E. If it starts with a dash and there's nothing else, then that's the letter T. But if it starts with a dash and then there's a dot, then that will be the letter N. If it starts with a dash and then it ends with another dash, that's the letter M. And so you can keep going down with that process and then you can work out what all the, what the messages or the letters are being transmitted. Okay, time for another quick break. And then I want you to have a look at two little activities just to start seeing what sort of data collections there are out there. And these are two that may assist you when you go out onto practicums to learn more about the schools that you're going to be visiting. The first is the My School um, website, which has data on all of the schools in Australia. And you can see their number of teachers, um, their NAPLAN results, the finances available to the school, and various other demographic information about the school, including attendance rates and things that just give you a bit of an idea about what sort of school you might be going to. The other site is to look at school catchments. So looking at the various schools in Queensland and if you're going to a particular school, where does it draw its students from? All of our state schools have got boundaries that the students within that boundary are sort of encouraged to go to that particular school. And so it gives you an interesting idea. Um, and as a beginning teacher and you may be moving to a new location, you want to find out where the students are, you might want to pick a house to live in just outside of the school so you don't meet all your students every day going to the laundromat or to the um, local shops. So have a look at those two activities and then we'll come back and look at our next context. Okay, so the next aspect of information-based solutions is around data interpretation. Now, again, a lot of this is addressed in the mathematics learning area context of statistics that explores how students, what skills students need to develop around interpreting data. But there are still some aspects around digital data and digital technologies that are important, particularly when students get involved in projects. Now, they'll often result in students needing to collect data and represent that data in various ways and then interpret that data to make use of the solution that they've come up with that involves using data. Okay, so in the mathematics curriculum in years three and four, students analyze the effectiveness of different displays of visualization. So how effective is doing it as a pie chart versus doing it as a pictograph? or as a table. So what's the best way of helping people analyze the data? They also look at very statistically informed arguments. Um, so making an argument for something based on statistics. So having some data to back up their arguments that they're making, saying that, um, yes, my grades have been going up, so I should be allowed more time to play computer games things of that nature. So they can show that something is happening as a result of the data that's available to support that argument. Um, in this example, students could investigate the media and how it can sometimes distort the data that's being presented. So in this case, we have two graphs representing the same information. The first graph showing people's favorite foods seems to indicate that hot dogs are far, far more popular than hamburgers, 10 times more popular. 
and twice as popular as pizza. But in reality, the scales have been truncated. Whereas if we have the full scale from zero to a thousand, we can see the difference between hot dogs and hamburgers is not really that great. It's only in the order of a few percent. So the first graph, which seemed to indicate it was 500% more popular, distorts the information through statistics. And students need to become aware that it's possible to distort information through how data is presented and then analyzed. So looking at the misleading ways data can be um, shown through broken axes or nonlinear scales and graphics not drawn to scale and, and so forth. In years five and six, um, students will be expected to be able to interpret and compare data sets and look at various ways that um, they can be displayed and visualized and how this can affect how they're interpreted. Time for another quick break. So in this case, we've got a couple of activities for you to do around people's names collected some data around names and um, the most popular names. So I do this activity with students in classes and I say, okay, um, tell me your name and then I can tell you when you were likely born. Or I can ask when your grandmother's name and I can give a really reasonably accurate prediction when she was born, generally within five to 10 years. Um, sometimes down to a single year if it's a particularly um, specific name. But it's quite surprising how names um, go through these processes whereby a name, a name becomes very popular for a short period of time and then drops away in popularity. So have a look at this little activity and it's a way of interpreting data. So what does this data tell us about names? How can we see that the data gives us more information than just the raw value of how many names occurred in a particular year. So have a look at that activity. And then another one, looking at baby names over the last 15 years in um, Queensland, where given a particular person's baby name, um, and again, I do this with students because I've got the data for the last 15 years. So I can take someone's name and I can make a reasonable guess as to where in Queensland they were born based upon the popularity of particular names in particular suburbs and locations around Queensland. Again, not 100% accurate, but reasonably so. So again, have a look at that. And it's another way we can take data and interpret and learn more about the meaning of the data than just the raw values. So do those activities and then we'll come back and look at the next learning context. Okay, now we're going to look at geospatial data, a little bit like what you looked at in the um, baby names around Queensland, where we have data connected to a location. And once we do that, we can do some particular things with that, especially around mapping. And students can often um, incorporate this with their studies of um, HASS in geography, in the geography context, and looking at how we can create maps and use maps to present data. Because a map is really just another form of data. It presents lots of information about where things are located, but also what is at certain locations. Um, and there's lots of information that can be presented through a map. Um, weather data is a very popular one that we're used to seeing on maps and where it's raining, the temperature, the humidity, and so forth. And nowadays, when we've got live data, we can have rain maps and um, weather radar maps where we can see where the rain is occurring in real time over a map. So there's lots of information that's available about the weather that's been um, geocoded onto maps so that we can now see what the weather is like in various locations. Another aspect 
um, is around flood data. This is the Brisbane River and there's various data um, interactions, interactives you can use on the internet where you can see where your street is and at what amount of rain your street will flood. Unfortunately, there's not that interactive interfaces for the Gold Coast. The data exists, but no one's actually turned it into an interactive tool like we have here for Brisbane. But it's useful for people when they're planning on buying a house, they can see um, how likely their home is to flood or the impact of a flood, how often those areas will flood. Again, taking the data about flood levels, how much water there was in different locations, and then plotting that data onto a map and then presenting new information as a result of that. In this case, um, being able to analyze that and see where areas will flood or not. So in digital technologies, we can also use various devices, um, particularly mobile devices, to support our geospatial data solutions. Particularly these are done in the older years, but some students do them in the early years as well, such as being able to work at our location using the GPS in our mobile phones. Um, or the digital compasses in our mobile phones to work out what direction we're moving, or the maps in our mobile phones to work out where we are and where we're moving. And nowadays, by sharing that data, we can see where our family might be located and things of that nature. Um, and this is all um, due to the fact that our mobile phones can transmit this information and they can detect where they are using satellite information so they can then know where they are and then tell other people where the mobile phone is. Now we can do that with other devices as well. Um, things called beacons and RFID chips uh, where we can have other things other than our mobile devices that can detect where they're located either by scanning them. So you can have what's called a beacon where you move in, have a mobile, uh, an app running on your phone that detects when it um, is in range of a beacon and then shows you certain information um, or what's called RFID, radio frequency identification chips. Uh, these are things like our, um, our, key, our remote keys for our mo motor vehicles. Um, they have a little chip in it that is transmitting information about that um, device. And when it comes within range of another device, such as our car locking system, it will then um, talk to each other. Now we can program these things. And again, while it's not commonly done in primary schools, it certainly has been done where students can create various activities and, and interactive solutions through the use of these technologies. Okay, so final set of activities to do is have a look at your password strength. So this is a little activity to just tell you how long it would take to break your password using commonly available hacking tools. Um, so put different passwords in and um, see what it results. I suggest you don't put your real password in, even though these sites are fairly secure and um, you could probably generally trust them. You should never really put your password into any site that you're not 100% sure of. But just change a little bit about your password, just so you can see what a very similar password would, um, how long it would take to break. The other activity in this is to look at whether or not your password has or your username has already been hacked. And there are websites that keep track of all the different hacks that have occurred. So for example, you might have been part of a bank that had been hacked and all of their usernames and passwords had been made available onto the internet. These websites keep track of all that and you can put in your username or your email address or whatever you've got and it will tell you all the different times you've been hacked and how much how many people out there or how many websites out there are selling and advertising your data for people to use to break into your accounts. And that's called being pawned. So try those activities and then we'll come and look at our last context, 
which is around data security. Okay, so data security and privacy are a big focus in the digital technologies part of the Australian curriculum and it's responsibility of digital technologies to teach the technical aspects of digital literacy in the general capabilities. So while all subjects, all learning areas have some responsibility around teaching students about digital literacy, which incorporates aspects of cyber safety and online safety, etc. Digital technologies looks at these particular technical aspects of that. Um, so students should be able to protect themselves and produce ethical, ethically, socially acceptable, sustainable and safe solutions to problems. Now, um, one aspect that we do a fair bit of is around cryptographic techniques. We talked about encoding and encoding letters and numbers into binary. That's just one form of encoding and decoding. Students can create their own codes. So not just encoding into binary, they can make up their own coding systems, which is called cryptography. So they can make their own code and they can then turn a message into gobbledygook. And then knowing how to decode that, their friends can turn that back into the message. And young children love doing this way of sending secret messages to one another. And they can use code wheels and various other techniques to do that. And there are also digital techniques to do that as well. But the main thing we look at is around use of passwords and password security and online safety and things of those, that nature. So that students are aware of what sort of cyber attacks can occur. Um, but also learning eventually over time about things such as viruses and phishing and denial of services and identity theft and hacking and all those other aspects. But in the primary years, particularly around um, password security and around sharing of information online. So in years one and two, um, it's often a very challenging time for teachers, having students remembering their passwords and their usernames. And one of the ways is having students record that information. And we tend to do that through um, username and password badges or cards that um, children uh, write that information down on and then the teacher can give them out their cards and so they can remember their usernames and passwords and likewise if they're using different websites having different usernames and passwords on different websites means they've got to have a set of cards so they can access various tools and devices now over time students will learn how to remember their passwords and usernames, but particularly in years in foundation and years one and two, it's a particular challenge. They also need to understand that there are certain websites and apps that store their personal information and that sometimes we don't want that personal information to be shared. Um, so understanding that and whenever students are coming to use an online tool or to uh, put information about themselves in, they need to think about whether or not that should happen or not. And it can extend also to things such as having their photograph taken and shared online or shared and a whole range of other aspects. Again, something that students are not very aware of in the early years, and it's also a parental responsibility to instill um, good practice around this. But in schools, we also need to take on some of that challenge. Of course, it's a significant issue as the children will grow up, particularly as some of this data can be used many, many years later, sometimes well in, into their adulthood. Um, and some of the things that students share when they're very young may be quite damaging to them in later years. Um, they should also discuss the importance of asking permission before sharing data. And this needs to be taught. Young children need to be taught how to ask permission. Of course, they don't necessarily know um, uh, how to go about asking permission. So they're not going to get in trouble by asking permission. What's the right way to respectfully ask permission of something and to accept when they're told no. 
um, and to understand that there are times when they won't be given permission. So these are things that they need to be taught and practiced in um, during their studies. But there are certain things that they should be made particularly aware of, such as sharing their date of birth, their phone numbers, their home addresses, sometimes even their full name, things of this nature. Um, date of birth is a particularly problematic one because a lot of websites actually ask young children to um, verify age before they give access to various services. Um, but again, if it's not required for a good purpose, then a site shouldn't be asking for that information. And in years three and four, students should be becoming practice at memorizing their password, but then looking at ways of making it easy to memorize. So it's hard for others to guess, but easy for them to remember. And there are various approaches that can be done towards achieving that, uh, using various naming conventions and things that they are familiar with, but, and can remember. Um, one approach is for students to keep a, a password book that they can record their passwords in and keep that secure so that they can then come back to it and use that. But there are also ways of doing that digitally now as well, having um, password services that keep track of all of your passwords. And so you only have to remember one password to get into the password services that will then give you access to all your different passwords for your different accounts. Um, but students can use different approaches, such as breaking up a familiar word or name with numbers and special characters and moving letters around and just making it more complex for someone to guess. Okay, so in years three and four, they also need to look at um, the sorts of data that's being recorded about them and what are the risks associated with that, um, such as when they want to um, save data or save documents, for example, that others can get access to. Um, can they then edit those documents? Can they change them so they can change their um, English essay so that it, they get a, a, bit, a worse mark? Um, or someone copies their English essay? Um, or someone could log in to their gaming account and do really bad on a game so that they go down in their scores. Um, can people tell their full name by looking at their gaming leaderboard? Things of this nature that they need to be aware of. Other aspects is around how people can go looking for information about them, um, trying to tell where they live by looking at their photos that they've shared or what school they go to by looking at their school uniform. Um, there can be information that people can get access to by what seems to be fairly innocuous data that they're sharing, particularly if they're involved in online forums, such as a gaming chat room, where they might discuss things like what they're going to do on the holidays or on the weekend, and how some people might be able to use that information. So knowing when they're not home so that they could rob their house or kidnap them by knowing where they're going to be. So things of reasonable, reasonable scary significance that they need to be aware of around stranger danger that extends into the online world, particularly when they're not certain who they are talking to. Okay, in years five and six, students learn about having multiple personal accounts and how they can use different accounts for different purposes. So one account they use with their um, close friends and family where they can share things more readily. Another account that they might use just for school. Another account they might use just for playing an online game with people that they don't know and how they would use different usernames and passwords for those different accounts. And then looking then at the risk of using the same password on multiple accounts. So that if someone learns their password for the account they have with their friends, say if they 
had a close friend who they inadvertently shared their password with, who they thought they would always be friends, but then they end up no longer being friends. But that that ex friend still then has access to um, their accounts. So students need to explore those and the risks and benefits for these various strategies. Um, and again, just looking at the idea of how having multiple passwords can be risky and how if then someone gets access to one of their accounts, they could have access to all of their accounts through that process. Okay, then in years five and six again, um, around the creation and permanence of their digital footprint, their digital identity, how people can go and find out about them um, by looking at information that's available online. Do they want the person that they're playing games with and having fun playing a competitive game with knowing where they live or being able to work out what school they go to? Now, sometimes they may want to share things for, for valid reasons, particularly between close friends and family. But there are times when they need to consider that it's inappropriate to share various material. They also need to understand that once it's shared online, it may last a long time and how it may impact potentially their opportunities to get a job or to go to a university, things of that nature. Those risks may be somewhat overblown particularly for young children, but there is concern around that. Um, in Europe, they're trying to bring in a process whereby all information about children are essentially deleted um, once they reach adulthood. So that nothing that they've done in childhood can then remain to go on and impact them into the future. But that may or may not come into play. Um, another example is looking at what's going to happen if someone does find out information about you. Um, if you're talking online about the names of your pets and you've also used the name of your pet in your password, does talking about that then compromise your password? Could they then guess that? Um, so there's a whole range of different things that you need to consider when you're sharing things online and how it may impact you in, in the present and into the future. Okay, and then how one strategy is to share the least amount of information that you can. Um, so for example, again, thinking about, does the website that's asking you about your birthday really need to know when you were born? Um, if it's needing to know your age, does it need to know the day and month when you were born, or just the year. Um, so there's a, things to consider when you're being asked to share information. Now, sometimes you don't have much control over that, but sometimes you do, um, particularly if the information is optional. So you need to think about, does the person asking for this information have a reason for that? And is it a good reason? Um, if not, you should then tell someone about that or block them or restrict access to them because they may be trying to um, get access to more information about you or other things that might compromise your cyber safety. Okay, so that's been a range of information-based solutions that students will explore in studying technologies education. Now, in your tutorials this week, before the tutorial, I'd like you to have a go at a geospatial mapping activity called, using a tool called Map Your List, where you take a dozen or so locations and then map them onto an online map. It's a very simple little process. There's a little um, instruction guide on the course website and website for you to go to. And it will then generate a map showing these various locations. Now, there may be places you want to go visit overseas, or there may be your favorite um, restaurants in the local area, um, or places that you've lived. Again, think about your own cybersecurity. <laughs> Don't share too much personal information, but think about something that you'd like to map, and then also consider how this could be used 
in a classroom context. It might be going on an excursion through a range of different locations and having students map that and create a map. It may be looking at where um, a community gets their water from and mapping that. It may be looking at um, where the seven wonders of the, of the ancient world are and putting that onto a map. There can be a range of different activities that students can create a geospatial map for. And this is a quick little activity for you to explore doing that. And in your tutorials, we're going to use the micro bits, little microcomputers, to um, do a soil measurement data collection activity where we measure the amount of the amount of moisture in the soil and add some water and see that increase and see that change on the micro bit um, and do some various other little activities on these micro bits and your tutors will take you through that activity and for the online students you're going to do the same but using a simulated micro bit um, where you'll do the activity you'll program it up and you'll um, think it through and you can change the moisture level on the simulated um, moisture probes uh, to simulate what would happen if you were uh, putting your digital uh, probes into a pot plant and seeing the, the moisture level change in the plant. Okay, so that's it for this week and I hope you enjoy the tutorials.